He is probably one of the most hated men on earth today. He's done. He's, he's a war criminal. He's a he's someone that perpetrated murder, you know, everywhere. But the story did not start like this. Russia это часть европейской культуры. Представляю себе и НАТО в качестве врага. The people of Russia are offering their hand to the people of the United States in friendship. But the friendship did not last. Now, the Soviets made it clear from the mid-1990s they were adamantly opposed to NATO expansion. If you don't want to see friend in us, an ally in us, but why do you want to make an enemy out of us? Welcome to Zooming In, I'm Simone Gao. Now that the war has started, what is the real good and right thing to do? Is it condemning Putin, doubling down on sanctions, providing weapons to Ukraine, championing Ukrainian people's bravery and patriotism, and then returning to the Cold War pattern against Russia? I agree that some of these things are what we have to do now, but we should not limit our thinking and actions to these aspects. Because if we do, the same tragedy might happen again in the near future, because the underlying cause of this war has not been addressed, let alone eliminated. What are the underlying causes of this war? I would like to raise a question. Could the precursor of this war be a series of long-term U.S. foreign policy fallacies? For instance, the misconcept that the balance of power politics no longer in play, which led to the continuous NATO expansion. Then lack of prudence, resolve, and consistency in responding to Russian aggression against other European countries. And finally, clumsiness in differentiating potential allies from foes. In other words, we pick the wrong enemy. In the next few episodes of our in-depth report, we will focus on one topic at a time. In the first episode, we we'll explore how a potential friend turned into a mortal enemy, and whether the balance of power politics is still relevant today. In Moscow, the hammer and sickle is lured for the last time, and an era comes to an end. On December 26, 1991, the leaders of three of the Soviet Union's founding republics, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, declared that the Soviet Union no longer existed. That dissolution of the 69-year-old communist empire marked the end of the Cold War. Two months later, the newly elected president of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, came to America to address the United States Congress. Please don't count the applause against the time that I have been allotted for speaking. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of Congress, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great honor for me to address the Congress of the great land of freedom as the first ever over 1,000 years of history of Russia popularly elected president as a citizen of the great country which has made its choice in favor of liberty and democracy. For many years, our two nations were the two poles, the two opposites. They wanted to make us implacable enemies. That affected the destinies of the world in a most tragic way. The world was shaken by the storms of confrontation. It was close to exploding, close to perishing beyond salvation. That evil scenario is becoming a thing of the past. Reason begins to triumph over madness. We have left behind the period when America and Russia looked at each other through gun sights, ready to pull the trigger at any time. Despite what we saw in the well-known American film, The Day After, it can be said today, tomorrow will be a day of peace, a day less of fear and more of hope for the happiness of our children. The world can sigh in relief. The idol of communism, which spread everywhere social strife, animosity and unparalleled brutality which instilled fear in humanity has collapsed 
It has collapsed never to rise again. I am here to assure you, we shall not let it rise again in our land. And he said, the people of Russia are offering their hand to the people of the United States in friendship to build a better world, a world without war, a world without peace. And this was exactly what the vast majority of Russians wanted. And I would even say that today, the vast majority of Russians would like to have, if not a friendship with the United States, at least a partnership. That was Vladimir Posner, an acclaimed Russian-American journalist and broadcaster, in a speech he delivered at Yale University in 2018 on the relationship between the United States and Putin. But the partnership he envisioned did not last long. Such hopes were tainted by, among others, a decision of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, commonly known as NATO, to expand their membership eastwards. John Mearsheimer, a political science professor at Chicago University, who is widely considered a realist in his approach to foreign policy theories, broke down the NATO expansion and its impact in its famous 2018 speech on the genesis of the Ukraine crisis. NATO expansion took place in two tranches. The first one was in 1999. That's when you get Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary incorporated into NATO. The second big tranche was in 2004. And that's when the Baltic states, you can see Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania up top, Romania, Bulgaria, these are the light brown countries. That's the second tranche of NATO expansion. Now, the Soviets made it clear from the mid-1990s they were adamantly opposed to NATO expansion. But number one, they were too weak to do anything about it. And two, it didn't involve the states that were right on their border. I mean, there's no question, as you can see from the map, that Latvia and Estonia are on Russia's border, and Lithuania uh, as well, if you want to include that little enclave between Poland and Lithuania. But, but the fact is, these were very small states. It was early in the game, and the Russians were willing to live with it. NATO was established in the aftermath of World War II. It constitutes a system of collective security whereby its independent member states agree to mutual defense in response to an attack by any external party. An attack against one NATO member is considered an attack against all. The Soviet Union was NATO's main adversary until its dissolution in 1991. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, was it right for Russia to have taken the Soviet Union's place as NATO's main adversary and to continue to be viewed as a major threat to the security of Europe? Why has NATO been so committed to expanding eastwards all these years? I began my hunt for answers to these questions and for a better understanding of the Ukrainian war in a discussion with Professor Michael Dash at University of Notre Dame. Well, I think it was a combination of things. Uh, I think most people in the West did not regard Russia as uh, the second coming of the Soviet Union. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there was a lot of interest in various uh, places in expanding NATO. Uh, some of the countries of the former Soviet bloc, and indeed, uh, especially the Baltic states, which had been uh, part of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, were eager to become part of NATO. Um, and I think that they were thinking uh, that this would be a hedge uh, to the possibility that uh, Russia did not continue to democratize and that relations between the West and Moscow, uh, you know, uh, would uh, not deteriorate. Now, I think in the West, there was, uh, you know, mixed feelings about uh, NATO expansion. I think some Western European countries were a little bit concerned about it. They didn't uh, see the need to expand NATO, and they were also worrying uh, 
uh, about taking in uh, new members. I think in the United States, though, uh, you know, there were some of us who were uh, skeptical early on, um, but most American political figures of both parties uh, supported NATO expansion. And again, it was a variety of motives that animated that support. Some people thought, well, NATO is a defensive alliance made up of democracies, Russia won't regard it as a threat. Uh, but there were also more hawkish uh, American political figures who I think thought that uh, the rapprochement with uh, the Russians in the 90s uh, would eventually end and we would need NATO uh, to counter Russia. In addition to the split of opinions on NATO expansion, Professor John Mearsheimer believed that the American leadership as a whole did not realize one important fact. That is, the balance of power politics is still in play in the 21st century. As all of you know, we have a Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine basically says that the Western Hemisphere is our backyard and nobody from a distant region is allowed to move military forces into the Western Hemisphere. I can tell from looking at the audience that most of you are old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis like I am. You remember how we went stark raving crazy at the idea of the Soviets putting military forces in Cuba? This is unacceptable. Nobody puts military forces in the Western Hemisphere. That's what the Monroe Doctrine is all about. Can you imagine 20 years from now a powerful China forming a military alliance with Canada and Mexico and moving Chinese military forces onto Canadian and Mexican soil and us just standing there and saying, this is no problem. We're all 20th, 21st century people and worrying about Chinese forces there is what 19th century people like Vladimir Putin worry about. Of course that's not going to happen. We're going to maintain the Monroe Doctrine with regard to China just as we did with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Initially, the balance of power philosophy was acknowledged and respected by both NATO and Russia. According to the newly published book, Not One Inch, America, Russia, and the Making of Post-Cold War Stalemate, written by M. E. Sora, on February 9, 1990, U.S. Secretary of State James Baker asked the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, would you prefer to see a united Germany outside of NATO, independent and with no U.S. forces, or would you prefer a unified Germany to be tied to NATO, with assurance that NATO's jurisdiction would not shift one inch eastward from its present position? The Soviet leader replied that any expansion of the zone of NATO was not acceptable. And, according to Gorbachev, Baker answered, we agree with that. Sera argues that, for decades after, various leaders in Moscow will point to this exchange as an argument barring NATO from expanding beyond its eastern Cold War border. Baker and its aides and supporters, in contrast, would point to the hypothetical phrasing and lack of any written agreement afterward as a sign that the secretary had only been test-driving one potential option of many. Baker's press conference just after finishing with Gorbachev only served to confuse matters further. At that press conference, Baker was heard saying, NATO's jurisdiction would not be moved eastward. This idea was not approved by then U.S. President George H.W. Bush, who sent an urgent message to Eastern Germany's chancellor, saying that NATO would expand its territory eastwards by creating a special status for East Germany territory within the alliance. Cole did not present Bush's idea to Gorbachev when meeting with him again in fear that the Soviet leader would turn down the reunification of two Germanys upon hearing Bush's request. Instead, he presented Baker's not-one-inch proposal to Gorbachev. Despite this, the reunification of Germany and the German alliance with NATO went forward. The matter was settled, with or without Russian support. NATO did promise it would not expand one inch beyond its eastern Cold War border if the Soviet Union allowed the two Germanys to be united, should they have kept their promise? Uh, my uh, opinion is that uh, Secretary of State Jim Baker's uh, you know, verbal promises to uh, 
Soviet uh, Premier Mikhail Gorbachev to not expand NATO uh, beyond East Germany uh, should have been kept. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously they weren't. And uh, we in the United States forget those promises, but the uh, Russians and especially uh, uh, President Putin uh, have not forgotten those promises. Furthermore, Eastern European countries who had aspirations to be incorporated into NATO or the EU were not bound by this promise, and they continuously send in applications. Professor, I think you, you mentioned this as well, that the NATO expansion and the EU expansion were not just the decision of those member states and America. They were also the wishes of the Eastern European countries that were under the former Soviet Union. They wanted to become democratic societies and be connected with the West. Are those legitimate aspirations that should be encouraged as well? If so, how should that reconcile with NATO's promise to Russia that it wouldn't expand eastwards after the fall of the Berlin Wall? Well, there are actually two ways to answer your question. Uh, in terms of international law, these countries are uh, sovereign countries. Um, and if they want to uh, join um, a uh, military alliance, that's their prerogative under international law. Um, but I think that there's another way to think about your question, which is the prudential uh, elements of the decision. Uh, if you were a country that was very close to uh, Russia and you knew that Russia regarded the expansion of NATO as the violation of, uh, you know, promises that had end the, been part of the end of the Cold War. And if you knew that the uh, Russian leadership was saying that they regarded NATO expansion as an existential threat, uh, you know, prudence would dictate that you would uh, ask whether NATO membership or the quest for NATO membership was worth antagonizing uh, a significant military power, which Russia is. Right. That's from the military perspective. Uh, there's another perspective, though. Are the aspirations of those Eastern European countries to join the West and become democratic societies also a threat to Russia because uh, they might inspire the Russian people to do the same? I don't believe so. I mean, you know, uh, many in the West think that this is not about NATO. They think it's about uh, the threat to uh, President Putin's autocr autocratic regime in Moscow. And the argument is that a successful democracy in Kiev it would represent uh, a threat to uh, uh, President Putin's regime. Um, I don't think that that is what's going on here. I think that this is uh, about primarily uh, strategic concerns. And <clears throat> what I would point to as a model is during the Cold War, uh, Finland was a uh, non-aligned neutral country. Um, but uh, in terms of its foreign policy, but domestically, it, it was pretty much uh, a uh, social democratic country, you know, not too different from Norway or Sweden uh, or, uh, you know, Denmark. Um, and so I don't think it's about democracy being a threat. I think it's about uh, member, uh, membership and a hostile alliance uh, threatening militarily uh, Russia. In the 1990s, although successive U.S. presidents were in favor of NATO expansion, there were dissenting opinions too. The biggest pushback on the expansion policy was the Dean of America's Russia experts, George F. Cannon. According to Surratt's Not One Inch, Cannon argued that post-Cold War NATO expansion tipped the balance too far away from protecting newfound cooperation with Moscow. 
NATO would have no obvious stopping point in Europe if it started taking on members beyond those directly on the Atlantic seaboard. In Cannon's view, such an alliance, while understandably desirable in the short run, would ultimately increase tensions and reduce U.S. options for peaceful resolution of any conflict with the Soviet Union. Cannon took that argument to the public on February 5, 1997, when he published a widely read New York Times op-ed in which he called NATO expansion the most fateful era of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era. A year later, he had a talk with Thomas Friedman. Uh, you know who Thomas Friedman is? New York Times old hand uh, columnist. He, uh, when this happened, this is already 19, this is um, 1998, he called up George Kennan. I don't know if you're all aware who George Kennan was, but he was one, in my opinion, perhaps one of the most brilliant minds, political minds of the United States in the second half of the 20th century, the man who devised the idea of containment of the Soviet Union rather than war against the Soviet Union, successfully did this. So, you know, a brilliant man, who, uh, who established the, the, the very foundation of U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. So Thomas Friedman called him up. The article he published in the New York Times is called Foreign Affairs, Now a Word from X. Why X? Because in 1947, in the magazine Foreign Affairs, Mr. Kennan had published this article about containment, and he signed it X. So, he called him up and he asked him what did he think about this decision to enlarge NATO. Let me quote. I think, this is May 2nd, 1998. I think it is the beginning of a new Cold War, said Mr. Kennan from his Princeton home. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely and it will affect their policies. I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. Cannon's prediction came true, including his prediction that Russians would gradually react quite adversely. Those Russians included Russian presidents Boris Yeltsin and Vladimir Putin. Because the Russian reaction, and specifically this is 1998, so uh, this is Yeltsin, late Yeltsin, was you promised not to do this. So how do we trust you if you make a promise? When Putin came to power in 1999, instead of complaining about the NATO expansion, he considered NATO membership. Take a look at BBC journalist David Frost's interview with Putin in 2000, the second year of Putin's first term as president of Russia. Россия – это часть европейской культуры. И я не представляю себе своей собственной страны в отрыве от Европы и от так называемого, как мы часто говорим, цивилизованного мира. Поэтому, поэтому с трудом представляю себе и НАТО в качестве врага. Почему нет? И Путин, похоже, решил на этот импульс. George Robertson, a former Labor Defense Secretary who led NATO between 1999 and 2003, said Putin made it clear at that first meeting that he wanted Russia to be part of Western Europe. Robertson recalled Putin asking, when are you going to invite us to join NATO? In which Robertson replied, while we don't invite people to join NATO, they apply to join NATO. Putin then said, well, we're not standing in line with a lot of countries that don't matter. I don't know if Putin actually thought Russia should be offered a speedy entry into NATO because Russia was more qualified than others, or if this is an indication that Putin was so eager to join NATO that he forgot his manners. Either way, 
the authenticity was there. You can tell. On February twenty first, twenty twenty two, in his address to the nation, right before he ordered the invasion of Ukraine, Putin reveals another occasion from that same time period where he made a similar inquiry. This time to an American president. Более того, скажу сейчас то, о чем никогда не говорил публично. Скажу об этом впервые. В 2000 году во время визита в Москву уходящего со своей должности президента США Билла Клинтона я спросил его: "А как Америка отнесётся к тому, чтобы принять Россию в НАТО?" Не буду раскрывать все подробности этой беседы. Но реакция на мой вопрос внешне выглядела, скажем так, весьма сдержанной. А как американцы реально отнеслись к этой возможности? Фактически видно на их практических шагах в отношении нашей страны. Это открытая поддержка террористов на Северном Кавказе, пренебрежительное отношение к нашим требованиям и озабоченностям в сфере безопасности, в расширении НАТО, выход из договора по ПРО и так далее и так далее. Так и хочется спросить: зачем? Зачем все это? Ради чего? Ну ладно, не хотите видеть в нашем лице друга и союзника? Но зачем же делать из нас врага? Do you think in the early years of Putin's rule he had a genuine wishes to work with the West and、uh, maybe even make Russia a democratic society? I mean, he did ask to join NATO and the EU during that period, but was rejected. Do you think he was serious? Um, many people thought that he was.、Um, matter of fact, there was、uh, an opinion piece in the New York Times today、um, that pointed out、um, that you know the New York Times、uh, foreign policy commentator Thomas Friedman had written、uh, you know in the early two thousands、uh, you know in an optimistic vein. Uh, about Putin,、um, President Clinton's、uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright had、uh, expressed some uh, hopeful uh, things about、uh, Putin and his outlook at about the same time. So many many people thought that、uh, you know he might be a、uh, you know continue the democratic. And generally,、uh, Western-oriented、uh, view of the、uh, the Yeltsin administration. Of course, President Yeltsin appointed him as、uh, interim president when he stepped down、uh, in 1999. When did Putin's view on the West change? Well, I, you know, he also,、uh, by the way,、uh, was. Quite supportive, at least rhetorically, of the、uh, United States after 9/11. So I don't think it. I think it was in 2007 that he gave his、uh, famous speech in Munich at the uh, uh, Munich Security Conference,、um, in which he outlined. You know, a series of complaints about how Russia was being treated by the West, and particularly in the security realm.、Um, and of course, you know, 2008 was when the、uh, largely at the、uh, behest of the George W. Bush administration、uh, that NATO opened the door for、uh, NATO expansion to.、Uh, Georgia and Ukraine. So I would say, you know, uh, the uh, early in the 2000s、uh, after 9/11,、uh, things started to change、mm-hmm. with Putin. What the world began to see in February 2022 was a Putin who had turned into a mortal enemy of the West. He was readying his forces to invade a sovereign country. And the main purpose of this speech was to find pretext to justify the invasion. It is clear today that Putin's war against Ukraine had other motives beyond trying to stop the NATO expansion. Still, from his wish for NATO membership 22 years ago to today's invasion, you can see how things have changed. Probably not to either party's satisfaction. 
Those 22 years proved to be a rough ride for Russia. As German Chancellor Helmut Kohl put it, Russia was attempting three major transitions simultaneously. A political one, from an authoritarian system to a democracy. An economic one, from a command to a market-based economy. And an imperial one, from a multi-ethnic empire to something much smaller. The Chancellor believed America and the West generally should do everything humanly possible to help the country, which he called a piece of Europe. But Moscow felt it didn't get much help from the West. Posner told its American audience what happened from a Russian's perspective. First, the enlargement of NATO. So that was number one. Then the bombing of Yugoslavia that was done by NATO, and NATO is, after all, dependent mostly on the United States, let's face it, right? Uh, the UN did not condone this. So the bombing of Yugoslavia, that's uh, from March 24th, 99 to June 10th, 99. Then uh, Kosovo and recognition of Kosovo, although it had been part of Serbia for centuries, and there were people in Russia who said, you're letting the gin out of the bottle. Because if you do this, then there are other countries that will do the same. And Russia did the same, vis a vis Abkhazia, to begin with, okay? Yeltsin was very angry. He made a speech, he said, and of course this is very Yeltsin-like, he said, we're not Haiti. You can't treat us like Haiti. We're a great country, we have a great past, and Russia will come back. Russia will come back. He was really, really angered. Didn't say the politically correct thing, but he spoke his mind. Not everyone entirely agrees with Mr. Posner's characterization of the dynamic between Russia and America during that period. Professor William Wolfworth at Dartmouth, who will appear in our next episode, told me he did not think it was fair to say that America was totally hostile to Russia. Rather, America simply found it inconvenient to try to deal with Russia. And I found a footnote for that. In the case of NATO's bombing of Yugoslavia, according to Surat's Not One Inch, U.S. President Bill Clinton did not go through U.N. Security Council for approval for this operation because they knew Russia would probably oppose it. In order not to put Russia in an awkward situation, they decided to bypass the U.N. Now going back to Posner, Professor Woodforth thought the fundamental point Posner makes is correct. That is, the United States ignored Russia's frequent and incessantly expressed concerns about the ways the U.S. was organizing European security. From a potential friend to a mortal enemy, that process took decades. And as Professor Dash pointed out, the first real sign of Putin's strong opposition to NATO expansion appeared in 2007. <laughs> Франклин Рузвельт, где бы не был нарушен мир, мир повсюду оказывается в безопасности. In 2007, in Munich, um, speaking to the 20, the group of 20 in Munich, Putin says this. This is February 10th. I think it is obvious that NATO expansion does not have any relation with the modernization of the alliance itself but with ensuring security in Europe. On the contrary, it represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust. And we have the right to ask, against whom is this expansion intended? And what happened to the assurance of our Western partners made after the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact? Where are those declarations today? No one even remembers them. But I will allow myself to remind this audience what was said. I would like to quote the speech of General Secretary Mr. Werner of Brussels on May 17, 1990. He said at the time, quote, 
The fact that we are not ready to place a NATO army outside of German territory gives the Soviet Union a firm security guarantee. Where are these guarantees? And do you know what the answer was? The answer was, yes, but that was guarantees given to the Soviet Union and your Russia. Well, what kind of a reaction would you expect? Um, last year, I think it was, making a foreign policy speech, Putin said, our mistake was that we trusted you too much. And your mistake was that you tried to take advantage of that. Since 2007, Putin has not tried to hide his disappointment with America. You get a taste of Putin's grudge against America from this Megyn Kelly interview in 2018. And third, we have re repeatedly suggested that the United States and Russia establish relations in this area and sign a corresponding interstate treaty on extraditing criminals. The United States has evaded this proposal and doesn't want to sign it with Russia. What are you hoping for? That we'll extradite people to you and uh, you will not? Uh, this is not the proper way to go about international affairs. There is more to it. Please listen to me and take it to your viewers and listeners what I'm about to say. We are holding discussions with our American friends and partners, people who represent the government, by the way. And when they claim that some Russians interfered in the U.S. elections, we tell them, but it's so fairly recently at a very high level. But you're constantly interfering in our political life. Would you believe it? They're not even denying it. Do you know what they told us the last time? They said, yes, we do interfere, but we are entitled to do so because we are spreading democracy and you're not, so you can't do it. Do you think this is a civilized and modern approach to international affairs? Until the Ukraine crisis first broke out in 2014, the West did not heed Putin and Russia's grievances. Professor Mearsheimer said that was why they were caught off guard when Crimea happened. What's very interesting is that there is no evidence that we thought Putin was aggressive before the crisis. There's no evidence that we thought that. There's no evidence that we were talking about expanding NATO because we had to contain the Russians. Because again, NATO expansion was driven by 21st century men and women. They believe balance of power politics is dead. That's what happened here. Do you understand? Putin is a 19th century man, right? He does view the world of balance of power pol in terms of balance of power politics, as do we when it comes to the Monroe Doctrine in the Western Hemisphere. But in this case, in the case of Europe, we were thinking like 21st century men and women. And we thought that we could just drive right up to his doorstep and it wouldn't matter. Right? We did not think that Russia was aggressive. What happened here is that after the crisis broke out on February 22nd, we then decided that Russia was aggressive. We then decided that Russia was bent on creating a greater Russia. It was after the fact. And by the way, this is why President Obama and virtually all of Washington was caught with their pants down when this crisis broke out after February 22nd, because they did not see it coming. After the two tranches of the NATO expansion, a new security landscape in Europe was created. Having failed to abandon the old Cold War pattern, the Cold War dividing line still exists, now between Article 5 Guarantee Area and non-Article 5 Guarantee Area. Only that line has moved eastwards, right up to the doorstep of Russia. After Putin's 2007 Munich speech, the relationship between Russia and NATO-friendly countries quickly entered a new phase, a phase where tensions build up conflicts emerged and war finally broke out. In our next episode, we'll talk about how NATO and America were not aware of Putin's geographical ambitions and did not think through how they would manage Russia's response to the NATO expansion.
Hi everyone, thank you for watching our in-depth report. If you like our production, please support us by becoming a member of our website zoomingin.tv. $5 a month or $50 a year, cancel anytime. We'll have extended interviews and full in-depth reports on our membership website. In the future, we will only put a portion of our in-depth report on YouTube. You can simply donate to us on that website as well. Finally, I would like also to thank our sponsor, Shen Yun Performing Arts. Enjoy Shen Yun at your nearest theater. For Zooming In members, you can get discounted tickets by visiting shenyun.org slash simone gao. Have a great day, and I'll see you very soon. You are not just watching a performance. You are witnessing a culture reborn. Now, you'll see what the modern world has never seen. China, before communism. Shen Yun 2022, live on stage. Get tickets now at shenyun.com.